My guest today is an accomplished musician, singer-songwriter, published poet, and uh, co-founder of one of the most original and successful bands ever in the 20th century, uh, Dire Straits. I'm speaking today to David Knopfler. Welcome, David, to The Connection magazine. Hello, Ian. How are you doing? I'm excellent, sir. Excellent. So Good. Good. We find you currently in Annapolis on a on a US wide tour, and you're going to be in. Yes, we're just um, I just played at the Rams Head, lovely little venue last night, really enjoyable, and we're heading off today to a, a place near Washington D.C. I think it's in Vienna, Washington D.C. Uh, should be fun. How are you finding the tour so far? You're you're flying solo on this one, I believe. Yes, I had a slight unexpected change of plan at the last minute and my co-partner in crime, Harry, couldn't come with because he's got medical issues. And so it's a little challenging, but it's fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes it more intimate, really. You know, it's just different. It's, it's, um, it's a little more work for me, but it's very rewarding. Well, your concerts are very intimate anyway, and um, uh, your music is so full of texture and emotion, I find. Uh, I, I love listening to your work. Uh, Thank you so much. Oh, no, solo and obviously with Dire Straits. Um, listening to your music, there is, it's one of the things that I found with you, uh, both solo and with, with uh, Dire Straits, is it's very original. It's, uh, I remember when you, when you came out with Dire Straits in the 70s, uh, I was at school in Devon and uh, was listening to what was around at the time and none of it really fitted with me. I was more into sort of the, the 50s and 60s rock and roll scene and, and uh, some of the jazz as well. And, and then you came along and it was a breath of fresh air. Um, and I'd love to know what your musical influences are and, and how they shaped you in creating both Dire Straits and your, your really successful solo career? Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I first heard, I suppose the biggest first influence would have to be Dylan, of course, like most songwriters. My sister, who's six years older than me, was probably about 17 or 18, and she brought back a couple of Dylan albums, old vinyl albums, to the house and just kind of casually said I'm, I'm not sure if she suggested to listen to them but maybe she did but and uh you know at the first play i couldn't quite get my head around it the second play i was really intrigued and the third play i was hooked and yeah. um and of course dylan was the man that opened it all up for everybody you know he made it possible for um he made everything possible because he broadened the whole scope of what what constitutes a song really totally yeah. And, and of, of course, you, you have poetry running through your veins. You're a published poet. Um, and the music that you produce, um, as I've said, I'm going to use this word a lot um, in reference to you, is, is texture. It's like listening to a, a, a musical tapestry, I find. Um, and, and that is, well, it's, you know, it's, it's the, I can see the Dylan link there. But the interesting thing is um, that what you produce is totally unique and I, I really encourage anybody listening to this to go and see one of your concerts if you're not in Santa Cruz then wherever you are in the world um, go and see David because the experience is 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 a very moving one I find um, oh, thank you Ian. well it's 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 so nice to have um, such excellent musicianship and songwriting um, and it's been consistent. You've had a very long, successful career, and you've maintained the consistency. I was listening to the acoustic album last night, and it's beautiful, absolutely oh, beautiful. Uh, how did that come about? Lack of money. <laughs> 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 I mean, it, not really. Well, kind of. I mean, we, we were being nagged for years at our concerts that we were playing the concerts, but the concert simply couldn't be bought on any of the albums. Which is anathema to me, really, because I'm I'm very happy to spend as much money as I can and, and make my studio records as high a quality as I know how. But there was obviously a demand for something that more closely represented the shows, and I didn't just want to do a flat reproduction, you know, monochromatic copy of a of a show. But I didn't at the same time want to go all the way to a studio production because I didn't want to annoy these people who've been nagging me for years for the live album. 
So we, with that, with with the album, with the acoustic album you're talking about, that's a kind of compromise. We went into the studio for about three or four days, and just played the played the the live shut the live songs exactly with no overdubs. But of course, inevitably, when you're in the studio, the temptation to cheat. So we've 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 gone one better and just brought out a brand an even newer one than acoustic called Made in Germany, which really is just straight off the desk with no overdubs at all, and that seems to be being very proving very popular too. I'm not really sure why people like like that because my my studio ears get offended by all the little mistakes in there, but maybe that's what makes it human. You know, um, I'm I'm going to put my other hat on here. I'm a bit of an audiophile. I've I've always been interested in audio gear and listening to really good quality recordings, which is one of the reasons why I've always loved your music because it's, you know, in Dire Straits and Solo, it's beautifully recorded. You can really feel the craftsmanship within the studio environment. Thank um, you. It, it, well, it is, and it's um, it begs a question, which I'll bring up in a, in a little while. But um, for for me, and I, I think this is for a great many people that that um, do that strange thing in this iPod age and actually listen to music, stop everything and listen. Mm. Um, when you hear the little sort of and little fluffs and things like that, it you, you get an emotional connection with the artist. It, it feels much more tangible to, to connect with you as an artist. You know, we may never see you other than on stage and we'll never know you personally. But when it, when it comes into the human experience where everything isn't so finely polished that it disappears, you, you connect on an emotional level to your music, I find. And, you uh, certainly get plenty of that live. There'll be no shortage of fret buzz. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's part of the appeal. And, and, sure. Um, it 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 it's a human experience, and I think you know when you're listening to recorded music, um, what you're trying to do is is get a reasonable facsimile of what you heard live, and yeah. uh, and, and the more that an artist can put that and leave some of the what what you would regard well definitely well definitely with Made in Germany it's all left we we pretty much just it was just a show that was recorded and I thought oh, that's quite nice I might just put that out. Put it out. Um, pretty much, I put it. I gave it to a mastering engineer, but he didn't. All he did was really just lined it up and turned it into a CD. So there's, it's about as raw as a record as you could make. But I mean, you know, as I, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, half jokingly, I mean, it's financial necessity too. Yeah. We're, we're we're no longer in the age where you can go in, where a record company will advance you two hundred thousand dollars and say, hey, you know, go anywhere in the world and take as long as you like. <laughs> you know, so. Well, it's this, now, it's now pretty much it. I mean, I'm still writing the songs and it's frustrating because what I really would like to do is have a five-star studio for a month or two and actually really make the record I want to make with, the, with my friends and with the players I want to work with. But that's simply no longer financially possible. Yeah, the whole landscape's changed with downloading, hasn't it? Um, totally, totally. Yeah, which brings me on to, to several things. I, I noticed that one of your albums, the soundtrack, uh, an album because you you write movie soundtracks as well is on HD tracks. It's news to me that there's a soundtrack album. As far as I know, none of my soundtracks are on albums. Somebody must have bootlegged one. Oh heck! Oh, it's, <laughs> you should go on HD tracks because it says it's a soundtrack album there. <laughs> oh dear! Um, and it's a straight uh, 4416 um, CD version. Uh, this brings me onto something, and, and I'm not sure if many listeners are appreciative of this, but we, we're in a quite remarkable time as far as downloading music is concerned because with cheaper bandwidth, faster download times, it brings the possibility to, to download uh, much higher quality files, sure. um, studio sure. files. That's correct. Um, and I have a player at home that, that I listen to. I was listening to some uh, Montserrat Caballé last night, uh, 2496 from an original master tape done in the 60s. Right. It sounds incredible. It sounds like you're listening back in the old analog days to vinyl. Right. right. Are there any chances of of you uh, bringing your back catalogue and the Dire Straits catalogue into well, that I think, realm? I think there's very little chance for me because um, it's I can't bring anything. Well, I could bring it back. Obviously, it could be downloaded at the same quality as CD, but. I can't bring, I don't have the analog tapes anymore, oh. what, what, what came before, because my wife thought, ex-wife I should say, thoughtfully destroyed them. Oh, um, she no. threw, the whole, threw the whole lot onto a skip thinking she was tidying up. 
So oh. I, I, I don't have any, I mean, I only have the CDs. I don't have any of the outtakes. I don't have any of the old, you know, master tapes or anything. They've all gone. Psh. Oh, what a shame. Shocking, isn't it? That really is. I'm, I'm really <laughs> sad to hear that because and I was. She was, so, she was so pleased at having, you know, tidied up for me and done me a favor. I couldn't even be mad at her, you know. Oh, no. There was very me, strange thing to have done. Very there was strange. Me vainly oh. hoping that uh, we, we well, would. It may, it may, I mean, I've no doubt that, the, that all the Dire Straits materials are still in vaults and carefully stored. This was just my stuff. You know? Yeah. But it would be lovely to hear your stuff because it's so rich and it's got so much texture and, and there's so much. Well, you know, and you record in, it so beautifully. In, in fairness, and it was recorded to sound the way it does on CDs, so I don't think you could really, you know, the, the CD quality that, that, that was put out there was, everything was cut and mastered to be that way, so I don't, I don't think there's going to be any, any you know, great changes. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of this stuff is gimmicks, you know, people bring it out in some other format because they know that there's some audio files somewhere who <laughs> so, pay for it and I, I really it's a bit like director's cuts they give you 17 different versions of the movie and quite often the punter's just going to say you know I like the original best you know this is true as well if a CD's been well recorded it sounds it sounds in my experience as good as the high resolution stuff so we you have, have to you have to wonder what to, I mean unless the direct I mean, to talk about movies for a second I mean unless the director's version was nastily brutalized by some asshole asinine producer generally speaking you know the, the final cut that they made at the time is, is as good as anything you're going to get yeah uh, I, do, I don't really I'm not a great believer in, in that kind of revisionism and, and you know I, I tend to play all my songs better now than I did then too so actually you know seeing me live I feel I feel like I'm delivering more more closely the spirit of the songs now than, than they're even on the that are on the records things things definitely improve with having been Perform, unless you get jaded, which I don't. Uh, yes. I, don't really, I don't do enough touring for that to happen. I was going to ask you actually, what what is after this long in the business? What is the motivation for you for going oh. out live still? Um, what is it you enjoy about a live live experience? Very really hard to say. If you'd asked me the day before the first show, I'd have. I'd have been dreading a bit. It's a bit like getting into a swimming pool, isn't it? You're standing on the edge of the pool and you're thinking, I don't want to do this, you know. And then, <laughs> and the minute you're in the water, you're going, Oh, this feels good. I'm enjoying this. It's it's a hard thing to define. But my mood definitely lightened once I got this first show under my belt, and I felt, Okay, this I can do this. This is good. Yeah. This is working. I think it's just the fact that you know you can do it and it works and 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 it encourages you to push a bit further and to push a bit harder and to and to. Get, it gets you back into the swim and it makes you think about your next songs and it, it just generally keeps the juices flowing, I suppose. Well, that's important. And, you know, for someone as creative as you and continually um, changing the game and uh, creating new works, um, being out there and seeing the reaction of the audience's face must be an incredible motivation to continue that. You know, for many a years, I hid away in the studios. I didn't really start seriously. To, I mean, I did a couple of tours in the 80s, but I didn't really start. Obviously, I did a lot of touring with the Straits. And I didn't really start seriously touring solo until about 2001. Wow. I got into this because I had a, I had a young boy, and I wanted to be there as a father for him and, until he was grown up and all that stuff. So I kind of took more or less a sabbatical from about 85 to 2001 for 16 years. I had two tours in that time. I did a few live TVs and stuff like that, but mostly, mostly I didn't tour. And when, so when I came back to it, it was almost like starting again. And um, I've built up in this 12 years a kind of a fairly solid, um, watertight way of doing it now, which is you know, either with a band or with Harry or on my own. And um, it seems to work, and I like it. Well, judging by the audience's reactions and... Uh... They were lovely last night. They couldn't have been nicer. They were really a nice crowd. Silent as silent as the grave, which is really always for, it's, it's a great compliment when they're not, you know, when it, when everything kind of stops as well. Even when they're eating, it's almost like, <laughs> you know, even when it's a diner place that I didn't notice, I didn't hear. I mean, even the waitresses seemed to be quietly doing their thing. It was a it was a pretty much a high fi sound. It was very nice. Oh, I love that. Are you recording these shows? I don't, probably 16 other people will. I mean, all this <laughs> turns up on, on, on YouTube with horrible sound off people's cameras and things. Oh, yeah. 
the terrible audio and terrible visuals and all the rest of it. And there's not a thing you can do about it. It's awful to think that this is what people think you sound like, you know. You know, it, it is, um, this is another thing with technology. It's a double-edged sword because, you know, I, I'm speaking to you via Skype and I use a cell phone, but man, I really try and keep all of those things to a minimum and keep sort of real communications going. Um, yeah. and, and now where people have a camera with a, a 10, me a, sorry, a phone with a 10 megapixel uh, camera and they can upload the concert before the ready yeah. concert's ended. Recorded at 44.1, and they may have the 10 megapixels or whatever the devil they call it, but the audio is still being recorded at almost at you know, dictaphone levels, you know. Oh, it's dreadful, absolutely dreadful, and it doesn't give uh, a real uh, insight. Yeah, yeah it doesn't Compress give an insight into what you're doing here, and this is why, you know... Um, to the frequencies just to, just to be able to record it. Well, you know, it compresses down and, and it's just robs, I think, compression for me, robs music of life. It um, does. It takes all the dynamics out of it. It really does. It really does. And, and this is why it's, it's so good to get people of your caliber out performing live in, in this day and age, especially with the way that the music scene's going as far as um, producing music and, and bringing it out for sale. Um, because CDs seem to be dying the death and, and what's left is downloads um, and hopefully at least we can have a minimum of, of CD quality in downloads. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so this this tour is, uh, how, how many dates have you got in this tour? I believe it's, you know what, I could go straight <laughs> online as we're talking and check. No I worries. I believe it's 16. Um, I'm just going to go to my own website and look at my own dates. How funny! While you're doing that, I'll I'll, I'll mention here oh. for the Santa Cruz area that you're going to be in Santa Cruz on Saturday the 18th of May at the uh, Cumba Jazz Center. Beat you to it, that. Cumba Jazz Club Santa Cruz. Yes. Yeah. And but we're playing in Grass Valley the day after, and we're playing at Club Fox in Redwood City um, two days before. So the Thursday is Club Fox, and then Saturday is Cumba. Now, have I got this right? Your your website is www.notfla.com? My website is www.notfla.com. That's correct. Perfect. So anybody that's listening to this, if uh, if you want to go and see an excellent live performance, check his website out. The domain name in the days when domain names were free, you know, and I didn't really think that there would ever be any need. It was a bit like CB radios back then. Yeah. It was all these other names like cars.com, hotels.com. Do you want any of those? And I thought, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was, when I saw it, I thought, bugger, he's got his name. <laughs> That's cool. It even occurred to me to, to make it David Knopfler. It just seemed the idea in those days was that the shorter the better. And, yeah. and bandwidth was at such a premium with the old modems, you know, 14 point, whatever it was. So everything had to be, you, you had to make a web page that was no more than about, I don't know, 20K or something. So, you know, you'd make your little GIFs and, and JPEGs as tiny, as tiny, as tiny as you could. And there was only about 30 lines of code that you could learn before you'd learned everything. I mean, there were no books, you know. Well, this brings us on to something else. And uh, another part of your pioneering career is, is online sales, I believe. Uh, well, I think you started, what, 95? I first did it, an awful lot of academics weren't very happy about it because nobody was doing anything commercial and I had to somehow learn how to do the scripts and make them secure and the bank didn't really understand what I was up to either with this idea of that people would, I was trying to explain that they wouldn't be sending their their credit card details unencrypted and they didn't understand encryption and, and you know, and I did eventually manage to persuade everybody, all the parties involved that it was, if, if we used PGP, pretty good privacy back in those days it was free. That no, it was just no way that this information could ever be, you know, de-encrypted online because I would take it offline and I'd only de-encrypt it for the few seconds it would take to put it through the system. Yeah. And um, so it was all hands-on and it was fun. It was an education. And then somebody somewhere suddenly one day came along and said, you can't do this anymore. We need 10,000 pounds. And it was kind of like, what? You know? Because you've got this HTTPS site, and we, .com, we want lots of money for it. And I'm like, you know, I'm out of here. I'm done. <laughs> Go to CD Baby and buy them there from now on. It, it's great, isn't it? They, they start a, you start something, and it starts so beautifully simple. And then it comes along, and they, they, they find a way of buggering it up, don't they? It just got more complicated. And, 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 you know, the thing got more and more corporate, as always happens. Although I remember saying to people, 
you know, one day there'll be it, there'll be a, when when you see a big Coca Cola advert at the bottom, it'll say www.coca-cola.com, and people laughed at me. They thought I was nuts. <laughs> but it doesn't help to be ahead of the curve, really, in my experience, because I somehow managed to miss every goal math that involved making any money from it. You know, and uh, to be honest, I just after about five, six years of it, I was just missing making music so much. I wanted to just get back to studios and getting back on the road, and I. My enthusiasm for it didn't really um, carry on much beyond, you know, beyond the point. But I think by the time that Microsoft decided this was a cool thing to be getting into, I was already getting bored. Yeah. So, um, you know, because I remember Bill Gates saying when somebody said they'd give away the, um, they'd give away the browser, Bill turned to one of the staffers who had enthusiastically suggested this idea and said, that sounds like the most incredibly stupid idea I've ever heard. <laughs> you know. So, um, you know, times change, don't they? And now it's, it's, ever, it's now it's basically destroyed the high street. Main Street's gone. Um, you know, all the retail outlets for records are gone. I mean, HMV in the, in England just gave up the ghost. I think they're the last big retailer. I, I was actually shocked. I was talking to some friends in the UK the other day, and uh, they showed me pictures of the town that I grew up in. Um, I was born in the northeast, but I grew up in Devon, in Dawlish. All right. And it's... Um, it, it was actually so sad to see that little town, and you're quite right. It's because of this, what's happened with the, with the technology, I think, you know? You know, and in America, it's the same story. We've got the, the gigantic Walmart that's just stolen away an awful lot of business from Main Street. I've got a, got a little house in upstate New York, and it's the same story there. Yeah, and it's going that way in the UK, and I think it's such a sad thing that um, this is happening uh, it, it robs life, it robs people of, of human interactions and, and, and a human level. Everything becomes a corporate level. And, uh, and To me, the corporations are a horrible virus that have really taken over America. And they've bought the politicians and they've bought the political system and they've bought the economic system and they've, they've debased the quality of life. And it's not their fault. It's not the fault of this individual CEO because he's as trapped as the next person. He's only as good as his bottom line. If he comes up with one bad bottom line, they dispose of him. Exactly. You know, it's kind of a machine. It's, it's a kind of a, a gobbling machine that nobody has control over. And it's producing these horribly warped effects. And it's even creating wars. You know, I mean, you wonder where it all ends. You know, it's, it's very interesting because uh, I think... Uh, I. I was watching the news uh, the other day uh, with Margaret Thatcher at yeah. her funeral. And very, I, a very divisive funeral, it, indeed. It was, and I noticed that uh, one of the things that was said, the reason why she deserved to have the funeral that she had, was because she fought the War of the Unions in the 70s. And I thought, you know, you're comparing a fighting of people's basic fundamental human rights with yeah. that of the Second World War and Winston Churchill. Of course, it's absurd. I, I play, I've just finished a gig about a week ago in, in, a, in a little northeast village of England called Ashington that was a miner's village back when I was a boy. And um, godforsaken place then and an even more godforsaken place now, as you could imagine, without the coal mines. Yeah. And um, the woman there, the mother of the, of the um, promoter and the, and the engineer there came up to me and you know said hello and she, she confessed. She said, I have to confess, we had a party, she said. You know? I mean, it's a terrible thing to, to, to dislike somebody with such an intensity that you actually have a party when, they, when they're gone. It's, it's, something's very wrong there, isn't it? it, I, can't it help, I can't help feeling that we've... we've, we've I mean, the, 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 this, this great divide between the haves and the have-nots that seems to be ever-increasing and has been increasing, in fact, for the last 30-odd years is, is very unhealthy. And it's actually... It's, Oddly enough, it's represented in the music business too, because there are guys like me, and there were lots of us in the 80s and 90s, who thrived in the independent scene and who lived very nicely in the margins. We didn't care about what was happening on, on you know, on Billboard. We didn't have to worry about the top 40. We didn't need. To, we didn't care. We were making our living, making our records, and, and doing our art basically in a kind of a and in a sense, we were freed because you were able to make a living and pursue your art at the same time. You weren't being expected to compromise your art so that Clear Channel would play you. Yeah. And um, that was lovely in many respects. And, uh, of course, the marginalizing of the, the, the squeezing of the margins and the pushing of, of 
a greater and greater percentage of, of the middle class and of, 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 of the most of us into these tiny margins has um, has caused trouble. And it's very much reflected in the music business too, that you know there are, there are a tiny handful of princes who, who make obscene millions and then there are probably a million artists who, who are back to, to, the, to the days of the 17th century troubadour. You know, they're as good as the last the last meal that the king gave them in the court, you know. It's, it's, um, it's a strange thing, but we, we, we seem to have, have lost our way in, a, in a, we're losing diversity and we're losing in all kinds of levels, environmentally, economically, artistically. Well, isn't this interesting because we're in a time where, where, where it's being touted that we have more choice than ever, and yet I find that this choice is a choice of mediocrity on, on largely, and, and we actually don't have choices. It's like um, back in the UK, you and I would have known we had three channels when I was growing up, um, right. and they were three channels of pretty good quality television. Well, actually, in, in fairness to the good old BBC, which has become a, a, a much-loved institution uh, as... As the corporate thing has, has has progressed, you know, and the cost of, I mean, in America now, I think the cost of a, of a Roadrunner or a Warner's cable channels to have, you know, to have HBO and Showtime and one or two others, the whole thing has become hideously expensive. And, and you know, for, this, for less money than you probably pay a month in, in America, you get the BBC for a year and you've got BBC 4 TV is, is a very high standard of television. So is BBC Two, and they still are making really pretty excellent documentaries and dramas. But yeah, it's it's five hundred channels and nothing on is certainly the case. I mean, you can, I, I you know, unless you know what what you're going to watch before you turn the, the idiot box on in America, you can you can waste two hours just looking trying to find something. It, it, it's true, and the idiot box is a good word for it. And I think that the dumbing down, and I think what's happened is that because there is so much content that has no substance, it's it's dumbed the population down to a level of numbness that they, they find it hard to feel anything now. You, you see this with disasters that happen and, uh, you know, terrible things in the world happen. And, and the sustain for that is, is now in days, if you're lucky, whereas before it could have been years. I, I, I remember in the 80s with apartheid, you know, that was a year-on-year-on a year battle to end yeah. apartheid. Uh, I wonder if that happened now. It would probably people would lose interest within a week. <laughs> yeah, the attention the attention span is. I mean, slow news is no longer news. I mean, the, the news, but the news channels don't 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 send investigative reporters anymore. I mean, the, the the age of the investigative journalist is all but done. I mean, if you know, there was a time. I mean, radio is all but done. I mean, I, I did an interview in a in a radio station last time I was going around America. And there was one person there who actually, uh, you know, l unlocked the studio to let us in and then locked it up as we were going out. But the station was still broadcasting because some kind of clear channel thing that, you know, it just it plays the hits of the last 25 years, 24-7 on a, on a computer decides which order to play them in. And, you know, there's no DJ and there's no producer. It's... It's crazy. It's a crazy, crazy. It's be like air. It's just a crazy world. Well, uh, I hope when you're in Santa Cruz or if you're online, we have an online publication as well that you check out the magazine because just as you're a troubadour, a modern day troubadour uh, doing your thing, the magazine does the same thing um, and it bucks trends and it reports things that nobody else will report. You won't see it on mainstream media. Um, or it's a, a bit. I mean, it's a worry. I mean, I think ever. I think we all got a wake-up call over the, the the weapons of mass destruction story. That that all the mainstream media outlets, TV, radio, and um, magazine and newspaper, all pretty much bent over and just said, "Well, this is what the politicians want. We're going to go with it. Yeah, we're going to run with it, and we're not going to do our job as the sep as the fourth estate." Uh, uh, and it worries me when you get to that. You know, America now has a, the judiciary with the Supreme Court are not doing their job. They they just basically make very conservative decisions repeatedly. Guarantee, you can guarantee which way they're going to spin it. We've got the same kind of, you know, and you've, you've got this very polarized thing of Fox versus them, uh, you know, the crazy nonsense of Fox that oh. reverse educates people. 
And then you've got MSNBC that's so far up the government's ass that it's just, you know, it's just people saying, you know, Barack Obama's wonderful in 5,000 different ways. It's very tiresome. It's, this is not what the news is supposed to be. I, th I have a feeling you're going to get a very warm welcome in Santa Cruz because you're speaking uh, love the language of the people there. Well, California is a, a barely shouldn't really be an American state at all. There's nothing really about California that belongs to, to the to the to the you know the good old boys of, of the neoconservative movement. That's for sure. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And it's much more. You're actually much more in, aligned to to the European to what Dick Cheney disparagingly called old Europe. And of course, ironically, old Europe is actually completely aligned to Roosevelt because Germany was remodeled on, on, on the New Deal. Yes. So we've actually, the whole thing is, is, a, is, a, is a paradox because actually if you really want to look at the true spirit of America, you'll find it more alive now in Germany than you will in America. You know, this is true, isn't it? You, uh, you, it it's very interesting to see that um, uh, happen and, and what's taken place. and. They really understand the notion of a free society. They really understand the notion of pluralism. They really understand the notion that the institutions of government need to do the things that they say they're doing and do it with transparency and do it without corruption. I mean, you know, in America now we've got this, and, and I love America, so I'm not, I'm not running it down. No, just no. With, um, I, I grew up with American music. All my roots are American. I have ancestors who are American. I've got a house here, family here. Um, I feel, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I keep, I've got a UK passport, but I feel as much an American as anybody else. And, uh, oh man, you know, it's frustrating to see it. And I see the frustration from a lot of people who live here. We're all, I don't really feel, the biggest problem is we don't feel that our, our politicians are going to represent us. And we have that frustration in England too, of course, where two thirds of the electorate voted for center left parties. And we got David Cameron and the Conservatives back, which was not really what what anybody wanted, much less the Thatcherite angle of, of his cabinet. There was a guy, Owen, is it called Owen Peterson? Owen, Owen Patterson? I've forgotten his name now. Mm -hmm. um, he's, a, he's the environment minister in, uh, in England, and he voted against uh, the European position, which was that these pesticides that are killing bees really need to be um, looked at, and we shouldn't be um, encouraging it. And, you know, which way did he vote? He voted against the general consensus of Europe in the, in, in a most bizarre way. What on earth is an environmental minister doing supporting Monsanto and big business? You know, um, I think that speaks volumes. What you're saying um, speaks volumes of, of the corruption of the system, of the, the ignorance of the system, and so, how it's controlled by these big, big companies. And a lot of it also is that, you know, nobody seems to understand that the very simple legal concept of prof being professionally conflicted. Owen Patterson, who was the Minister of the Environment in the UK, shouldn't have been appointed because he's a big gentleman farmer who uses petrochemical methods on his farm. It's all, it's all intensive agriculture. These, his cows never see daylight. You know, his chickens never see daylight. His fields get sprayed by chemical crop, chemical, the Monsanto process of... And, and he's desperate to see GM crops introduced in Britain. And, and ev you know, everybody that, that has GM crops in America is wishing they could put the genie back in the bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then this is why uh, I'm so pleased to see in the UK that they still haven't got GM crops. And I think every time they try and do a trial field, they burn the thing down, don't they? And I, I, I keep telling my friends in the UK, for God's sake, don't go down GM. No, it's a dangerous route. And Europe, I mean, Europe basically voted this, they voted to ban bee pesticides, you know. I mean, despite the fact that the UK, to its shame, had a big businessman who, who was absolutely frantically trying to do Monsanto's bidding because it was in his own interest, because that's his farm. Organic farming to him is simply competition. Well, it strikes me that the UK has gone a bit like the US in, in terms of politics, and it's the old boys club, and it's who you know, not what you know. Uh, it's, it's, it's very, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, Tony Blair turned his back on over a million demonstrators who said, don't do it, Tony. And over Iraq, he was, it was a, the biggest demonstration in the history of, of, of the United Kingdom in I, London. I actually and, think the rot set in with him, actually. Well, I, th I think he just didn't do anything to, to reverse the damage that Thatcher had done. Yeah. And I rather feel that Obama's in danger of, of not leaving the legacy that he would have wished to. I mean, his, his speeches and his heart seem to be in the right place, but the paralysis of the system seems to be, um, you know, he's, it's not helping. I mean, I think this is about the fourth time he's come out and said he wants to see Guantanamo Bay 
detention camp closed, Gitmo closed. I mean, saying it and being unable to do it strikes me as, as very odd, you know. I think it speaks volumes of, of where the power base really lay. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm sure you're right. Anyway, David, I know that you've got a busy schedule and uh, we're cracking on here for 36 minutes. And uh, I, I... Right. Sorted out now. Oh, excellent. I could hear the zips going. I was wondering, he's getting on a plane. <laughs> so I, I, I want to round up the, the interview by just asking you a, a simple question about music and about how you feel about your music and where you feel it has a place in this world now in this modern world of downloads and so forth? No, no disrespect to my, to my audience, but I don't much care, really. I mean, I, I just make my work because I make my work. Um, and I've always made work. I've, I've been, been, a, been a singer-songwriter all my life. I've, I've written songs since I was 10 or 11. And I've often done it in situations that were very odd. I mean, even as a kid, when I played at the folk clubs, um, the school folk club, and my school had corporal punishment as you'd understand being English, that oh, yes. teachers and the headmaster were basically, they were supposed to beat the shit out of you most of the time, and that was fine. And uh, that was considered okay. It was considered the done thing. It was considered helpful even. And so I remember saying, I mean, I'd write a song and I'd go to the school faculty, and this is a traditional Irish song, because <laughs> I was sure that somehow I'd get some sort of corporal punishment trouble for having performed my own song. So... It's nothing new to me to be in a situation where you're in the margins or, or where, you're, where, where you're effectively pushed into a kind of a dissident position. Uh, because it's, it seems to me it's all, art's always been there. And if it's not there, there's something a bit wrong. Maybe it's supposed to be there. In the same way that journalism, you're not supposed to like the politicians. You're not supposed to be everybody's friend. You're supposed to be getting to the truth in the end, whether it's an emotional truth about a relationship or whether it's a political truth about a government. I think art, art in its best form, and, and I, uh, I will say this about your music, um, it really is there to remind people that they are individuals, that they are able to think for themselves, feel for themselves, and, and able that's, to follow dreams. Let's not forget the Monty Python line, right? We're all individuals. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, David, I think we'll, we'll close the interview today. It's been a, a real honor and a pleasure to talk with you. I'm so grateful for you spending time with Connection Magazine today. It's, it's been a real honor and a pleasure talking to you today. I, I, I do want to stick my hand up and say that you're one of my all-time musical heroes, and I'm so grateful for the contribution that you've given to music. Well, uh, thank you. One of the nicest things anyone's ever said. I'm, I'm very grateful, and... Um... I see you. Hope I see you in Santa Cruz then. I uh, I certainly hope so, David. Good luck with the tour. Safe travels, and thank you once again. Thank you. All the best, mate. And you. Bye bye.